If you're a pre-sales team and you're listening and the only thing you measure yourself on revenue, which is like a lagging KPI, it's like an outcome, then that's kind of like following a sports team and going, yeah, we got the right result. To hell with the performance, we got the right result. Well, did you get lucky or did you train for that? It's hard to make success repetitive if you're doing the wrong things that get the right results. So I'm a fan of doing the right things. And if they don't get the right results, cool, we can change it. This is Reveal, the Revenue Intelligence Podcast. Here to help go-to-market leaders do one thing, stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, then this show is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Howdy, howdy, howdy. It is The Rev. Danny Wasserman coming to you with this week's episode. And if you're on the edge of your seat, you should be because we have an incredibly refreshing episode. Not that all the other weeks aren't, but in particular, we have Adam Freeman, the Buyer Enablement Director from the Access Group. Questions you may be asking, what the hell is Buyer Enablement Director? What the hell is Access Group? Well, hold on to your knickers because Buyer Enablement Director is Adam's progressive stance on advancing the role, the clout, the legitimacy of more conventional, what we refer to as pre-sales. Access Group, you know, just 6,000 people working over in the UK, leading juggernaut. So clearly, he knows what he's talking about, having spent over a decade there. And what the hell is Adam going to talk about when it comes to buyer enablement and influencing the sales cycle from the persona of being in pre-sales? He's here to debunk all of our misconceptions that they're just glorified demo ninjas. Oh my God, if you told that to Adam, he would slap you upside the head because you are marginalizing an indispensable, a mission critical, a vital role. And along the way, he's going to talk about how you can activate a tighter partnership with sales, how pre-sales or buyer enablement, how they can play nicely with sales. All of this is in service of a more simpatico attempt to get your buyer more seemingly educated so they aren't stuck in indecision which, as we know from our episode with Matt Dixon, is plaguing so many of your sales cycles. I have said too much. Adam is far too compelling, charismatic, and convincing comparatively to me. So it's time for me to put a cork in it. Don't you dare take those AirPods out of your ears. Enjoy this week's episode with Adam Freeman. Adam, welcome to Reveal. Thank you so much, Danny. Thanks so much for inviting me on. All right. So as we alluded to, we got to start in a few different places. 11 years Mm. plus at the Axis Group. That in and of itself, before we even talk about your role in pre-sales, which I want to unpack too, it makes you an anomaly when we have so many people that are susceptible to going to the highest bidder. They may be here for six months, maybe a year, but over a decade situates you as an authoritative tribal knowledge holder. Talk to us about what's kept you there for so long. So I'm either terrible at interviews or I absolutely love it here and I haven't quite figure out which of the two it is, right? Yeah. People think, God, that guy's DMs must be like drier than a cream cracker. But no, it's, it, I love it here, right? And when you love something, sometimes you got to know. Everyone says, you know, the saying, the grass is always greener came about because someone figured out after the event that the grass was greener somewhere else, right? I'm just hopefully smart enough that I figured out, hey, I've got some really green grass here and I love it. So I'm just going to stay there, right? Like. Do you know, I think you hit on a really important point because I think for me, it's about building a legacy. For me, it's something bigger and I want to be a leader in the industry and the profession, all the things we're going to talk about today. And sometimes I think to do that, I think the loyalty that I've got to access, but they've also shown me in terms Mm -hmm. of giving me a stage to perform and giving me the opportunity I've had at a growing company. Pace. I mean, it was a hundred and odd employees when I started, you know, we'll tip in six, 7,000, whatever the number is now. So. The growth has been phenomenal. It feels like a different company every three or four years. So I don't feel like I've worked for the same company for 11, 12 years this December, right? On the 11th of December, I actually started access the day after I qualified as an accountant. The very oh next goodness. day, I took my last exam as an accountant. I started at access the very next day. So I knew it was right for me. It was just something's meant for you, Danny. It's not going to go past you, right? And this was meant to be for me. So I feel very fortunate and privileged to be well, here and relevant after 12 years, actually. On the introspective question, you know, am I as dry as a cream cracker when it comes to interviews? I can assure you right now, our listeners would concur. You are anything but that. So <laughs> it speaks more to your loyalty than anything else. A thing that you mentioned, I found fascinating. You have this aspiration to leave a legacy. And I think mm. a way to do that is to push the batteries, push the envelope, do things differently. And again, speaking to the jolt effect, obviously we need to be bold and daring. You 
have done an amazing job. Dare I even say epitomize what it means to push those boundaries in pre-sales. And yet let's also take a step back and register the stock of pre-sales today. Oh, pre-sales. Yeah. You're a bunch of technical experts. All you do is demo and then you get out of our way. And the folks with all the swagger and the chops who can chum it up will close the deal. Help us understand why that is a crock of shit. Oh my God. I thought just that whole mindset is just like turning me inside out. You're triggering me here, Danny. I'm not going to lie. You're triggering me right now. So why is it bullshit? If you asked a buyer who they really wanted one conversation with, do you think they'd want to speak to a pre-salesperson or a salesperson? Oh my God, those slimy sleaze balls that are charlatans that are out there with an ulterior motive. You can't trust us any further than you can throw us. Yes. No, it's important, right? But it's important that actually there's a mutual respect, I believe. And actually, if there's anything that we can get out of the show, it is that mutual respect. Okay. Buyers get a lot of comfort because, you know, you look at the jolt effect, you look at the majority of deals aren't won or lost, they're in they're indecision. And mm -hmm. actually, I believe a good pre sales person is the difference between indecision and, and a loss. I think that a good pre-sales person turns indecision into a win. And I think for those customers who are typically on the phones, I think they will push it one way or another. Because sometimes, hey, do you know what? It's better to lose than it is to get indecision. Because at least you know an outcome. At least there's something you can learn from and put into practice. I spoke to Matt Dixon about this before. He came on my podcast and we spoke about it. And actually, the role of pre-sales is important because it's so fundamental to a great seller. And the very best sellers I've worked with, the very best, have had a very high level of respect, pre-salesperson and this way of working, especially if you're in new biz where you've got that kind of lower ratios of sales to pre-sales, where you can really work as a partnership. Those absolutely brilliant, you know, just the chemistry is just right. In front of a customer, it comes across so powerful because you're not trying to tread on each other's toes. You're reinforcing each other. A salesperson, is, I still say this, has got the hardest, per, hardest job in sales. So selling, and getting that fingerprint on DocuSign or pen on paper, however you complete it, is the hardest millisecond in the whole sales cycle. Mm -hmm. Because that's the moment where everyone feels the weight of everything in that sales cycle, in that moment when they're about pen and paper. And ultimately, it's a salesperson that gets that. So I've always had the highest, highest level of respect for a salesperson, but you don't arrive at that meeting to get that signature unless you've done the pre-sales element in an extremely great cut. That's what proves the value. If I'm asking you for money, I've got to give you value back. If you can't demonstrate and make it tangible and believable, who's signing up to that? So Adam, one of the things that I want to get down to brass tacks on is this idea that the prototypical makeup of an AE and an SE, at least at face value, seem to look different. And some of that probably has to do with how they're incentivized. Let's talk conventionally that an AE ordinarily might have a 50% fixed income with a 50% variable not knowing where that other 50 is going to come from because they have to bet on themselves. It's an eat what you kill role. SEs generally don't have that same degree of risk in how they're paid on the job. So inherently, it's already going to start selecting a different population of people. We had mentioned earlier in a question, hey, like the best AEs have this understanding, a devotion even to the SE and the contributions that they provide in this value exchange with the customer. And then I also want to talk about, do SEs have an appreciation of that risk threshold that AEs take on? Walk me through sort of who you typically find in the SE role and how do they complement the appreciation across both sides of the aisle? Yeah, I think it's important to look at the kind of person that goes into being an SE and what uh -huh. kind of profile is typically a great SE. And I do think that's changed over the last decade, for sure. You think a decade ago, no, cloud was a new thing, right? You still got CD-ROMs and you would go to a server and you'd install some software, right? And that's how we deployed. And it was a very technical level of sale to achieve it. But now with cloud, actually, it's a very kind of outcomes-focused value engine, value, it's proven value. And most buyers have actually previously bought software as well. I think that's important to note. It, there's very few first, genuine first-time buyers out there in the market now. So I do think we're in a different place. And I think that the SC now is typically someone who may have come from industry. There may be somebody who had been in sales, but didn't like that pressure of eat what you kill, as you termed it, right? They didn't like that. I'm not knowing predictability yeah. of income and all the other things that go with sales. That's high risk, high reward. Some people don't like that and actually gravitate to pre-sales. And I think there are so many pathways into pre-sales now that there weren't a decade ago. And I think it's important to understand that there are a cohort of people that maybe they've been great consultants. Maybe they've been great CSM people. Maybe they've been product managers or support people. 
but they want a bit more commercial in their life, right? They want that thrill of being in a sale, yeah, without the risk of having to make the sale. And that's the difference. And that's what makes a good pre salesperson is that they don't want to be the star of the show. They don't get necessarily that satisfaction from, oh my God, I've made 110% of my quota this month because actually it's for the greater good of the team, it's for the mm -hmm. greater good of the company. And actually, no pre sales person I know gets any satisfaction from selling a credit now, right? I'm going to sell this, but hey, you're going to, we're going to credit it six months later because we cut totally over delivered. I don't know a single pre sales person that will be happy with just putting a number on the board. So I, I do think how the comp works is relevant to the type of person and it's mm -hmm. reflective of the risk. I think a typical tenure of a pre sales person compared to a salesperson at an org is higher. Mm -hmm. You know, they will stay at an organization longer. And they'll stay within a given industry longer. They won't typically move to something alien outside of industry. They'll get famous in an industry, as I would like to call it. You know, are you making yourself famous? Are you known for being someone who can champion the industry as well as the software and promote that to the customers? So I do think it's a different makeup of person that goes into an SE as it is a salesperson. And when we talk about, again, these typical qualities we see in an SE mm -hmm. versus an AE, Okay, we see AEs who get the, I don't know, characterization. They have swagger. They have moxie. Dare we even say that they teeter on arrogance and hubris? And by extension, because they pursue the spotlight, they want all that credit, that thrill of dopamine and serotonin when the signature comes in on the PO. Well, go figure. They now have a seat at the C-suite. We have CROs. That is a mm -hmm. very commonplace position now. And yet, we keep talking about how pre-sales is shortchanged. And I don't disagree with that state of the union today, that there's an indispensability that your team and the pre-sales function provides. And without them, none of these deals get done. And when you talk about, Adam, you leaving a legacy, how do we legitimize the pre-sales function more? How do we get pre-sales a seat in that rarefied air of the C-suite? I think two things actually are important. I think you need to be, if you listen to this and you're in a pre-sales role, I'd say, what are you doing to give your CRO, your CSO, a new perspective on pre-sales? That's got to come from within the org, right? Uh -huh. I'm very fortunate to work with a CSO and a new VP sales that really believe in the value of pre-sales. So I feel very heard. I feel very respected within the org and I feel like I can create the change I need. To. I know a lot of pre-sales leaders that are not in that camp, right? Because, hey, it's revenue, it's revenue. By the way, pre-sales guys, go do your demo, right? And if, if that's the attitude within an org, it's very hard to change that unless you change the CSO or the board member who's sponsoring that view of that. What I would say is, how many sales orgs do you know right now that aren't trying to become more customer-centric? You know, do you know a single sales org out there that's not wanting to be more about the customer right now? Absolutely not. Everyone's chasing that Nirvana coup de grace state. So that is where pre-sales come into a rarefied air of their own, right? Because mm -hmm. I'd ask, to answer your question, I'd ask it in reverse, actually. If you're a seller listening to this podcast now, imagine if you have no pre-sales person to call on, no video content, no demos, no technical, no ROI, none of that stuff that just gets done. Imagine you couldn't call on that and you've got to run a sales process. How successful do you generally think you'd be? And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not bagging on sales here. Like I'm married to a salesperson, right? I love salespeople genuinely, but I just think that respect comes from sometimes you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And I'd ask yeah. people to think about, right, what would happen if you couldn't do that demo? What about that? And we've got to go do a demo tomorrow. There's a last minute. They've got buyer's remorse. They're about to sign and they've got this worry about this. Can you just knock me up a demo tomorrow for 11 and we've got an hour with them? Can you wow them in an hour? Every, every pre-sales person on the planet's had that. I love that feeling, by the way. I love putting a cape on, going into the deal and smashing it out of the park and off it. I, I love that feeling. But if you're a salesman, think who's doing that, you know, who's really just getting over those final hurdles, technical hurdles to arrive at that, like I say, you sign on paper. And do you know, what? I'm so happy when I see salespeople earning good money, celebrating success. I think it's brilliant because that means we're doing our job because salespeople are successful. And I think that's just a wonderful thing, right? One of the things I want to double click into from that last snippet, our listeners have asked for really tactical takeaways. So mm -hmm. some of the things, because we've got pre-sales leaders who listen, we've got sellers who listen, we've got C-suite executives who listen. And the achievements you've made at Access Group, I think in some respects are contingent on, you've garnered over 11, almost 12 years, you've garnered that ear 
of the decision makers. And not everyone who's a listener has that tenure to wield such influence. But I do think that you have separated yourself, Adam, as a forward-thinking, progressive leader. Talk to us a little bit about the things you can control that are maybe reflective or resemble what your peers who have less tenure and seniority, what could they do to reverse the prevailing tides? reverse the tendencies to oversimplify or marginalize pre-sales contributions. And maybe it's also reverse the prevailing tides of, you know, solutions engineers, solution consultants, pre-sales personnel who look mm -hmm. on at sellers with the wrong perception as well. What are you doing that you could then pass along so people could replicate your playbook? Okay, really simple. If you're after tactics, I'm known for being quite full thinking in terms of KPIs. How do I add value to an all? Because if you're a pre-sales team and you're listening and the only thing you measure yourself on revenue, which is like a lagging KPI, it's like an uh -huh. outcome, right? Then that's kind of like following a sports team and going, yeah, we got the right result. Uh -huh. To hell with the performance, we got the right result. Well, did you get lucky or did you train for that, right? Because, you know, it's hard to make success repetitive if you're doing the wrong things that get the right results. So I'm a fan of doing the right things. And if they don't get the right results, cool, we can change it. But do the right things and then hold yourself accountable for the right results or the wrong results. Don't get lucky and do the wrong thing, but get the right results. So, and what I mean by that is if you're going to your KPIs and you're looking at your pre-sales team and measuring effectiveness on win rates and on revenue, you kind of look at the same thing, same coin from two different sides, right? Yeah. I'm looking at how efficient am I? How can I impact CAC? So if pre-sales are going to be seen as a cost, which they are in some orgs, all right, see me as a cost, but what I'll do is I'll return you more value per cost. Right. I'll put that into my, my advantage where I can. So I'll look at my pre-sales team, like a, like, like a factory. You deliver me pipeline and deliver me good quality pipeline. We'll churn it through the factory. We'll waste as little as we possibly can off that production line. And out of the end of that factory, we will produce high quality sales that are ready for signature. And what goes on either side, delivering to the customer and delivery from, you know, the pipeline in is kind of someone else's responsibility. But in that factory, I've got to own everything that happens. So I'm looking at how efficient are we? Can we get our ramp time of pre-sales quicker? Can I lead the way in the org of doing things like, yeah, but I can get my ramp time faster. I can do competencies. I can do skills. I can do all this kind of forward thinking stuff. Analyzes my team in a way that I'm adding value beyond the revenue metric. And I'm looking at leading indicators, right? I'm looking at things like who's looking at the softer side of the sale? Who's getting feedback from the customer going, how would you rate that interaction out of five? How would you rate that interaction? Give me some contact, give me some feedback, and then analyzing that at scale. I want to know the softer side of what the buyer's thinking in that moment as they go through the buying cycle, because I can counteract that. I can change that. Whereas sales are only in revenue. That's cool, right? We need someone. We've got marketing only in pipeline. We've got sales only in revenue. Who's only in the in between? Mm -hmm. And so I call on pre-sales leaders and revenue leaders to look at that bit in between and don't, look, don't let revenue become an outcome. Make it predictable. And when you talk about not prioritizing or placing all the focus on revenue, I think mm. that the theoretical of that is beautiful. It's progressive. It's, dare I even say, revolutionary. And at the end of the day, it's still a business. There's still a bottom line. Yeah. You still have to answer to whether it's investors, whether it's the board. And I wonder, just help us understand a little bit more when you re- focus energy towards those leading indicators and away from what is a concrete measurable outcome like revenue. Well, does that then all of a sudden let SEs off the hook? In other words, a deal slips. They say, oh, but we're not focusing on revenue. We're focusing on the assembly line. We're focusing on all these inputs yeah. because we're making our cost center more efficient. So if a deal slips and the revenue doesn't come in, no biggie. Talk to us about that. If you're looking at efficiency, so you look at things like how many hours of demo you need to close a deal, right? If I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, okay, could I make my demos look at? Could I make my persona-led demos better, more targeted? Mm -hmm. Do I really understand the ideal customer profile that I can demo and talk to? Do I really understand the three killer things that customer is looking for change in to achieve the sale? Or am I just demoing an end-to-end -end solution every time and hoping I get lucky, right? Like... That, that's not the way to do things. You need to really understand. And actually, I would tell you, I would push. We look at, for example, how much discovery time we spend versus demo time. Uh -huh. And we mess around with that kind of equation because doing too much discovery turns it into an interrogation, right? But not doing enough. Can I really demonstrate that value and prove it and give predictability of outcome? Which anyone that's read Jolt Effect, that's a big yeah. part 
of avoiding indecision, right? So I need to ask and know enough, but I've also, I'm kind of asking here, well, who's discovery for? These stages in the sales cycle happen and buyers don't buy in that lovely linear CRM system end-to-end stage thing, but they don't have gates, right? They don't move from stage evaluation to decision and discovery. They don't do that. They will move around that like a bowl of spaghetti. And everyone's seen that Gartner, how buyers buy them, right? Yeah. Everyone's seen And never a truer thing has been said. And so we need to think about how we help people navigate through that end-to-end when it's not linear for them, where they haven't maybe brought in a larger enterprise deal that's complex, that's changing all these different job roles at their company. You know, they've got people who are sat there going, and no... No sales or pre-thought person now does it. That software is great, but I can see it's going to make me redundant if you're a functional user. People are scared of things like AI right now. They're scared of this stuff. And so you're going into battle with predetermined ideas about what you're there to achieve as a seller, right? Ab's 100% right. Pre-sales is vital. Would it surprise you to learn that from a study published on LinkedIn, companies with strong pre-sales capabilities consistently achieve 40 to 50% win rates in new business. And get this, 80 to 90% in renewal business. So what's the deal? Well, based on that research, focusing and defining your pre-sales process can lead to the following. Increased number of qualified leads, faster lead cycles, reduced churn rate, higher ROI, and more. So what can you take away from all this information? You got to focus on driving your pre-sales process, making sure that they're not being marginalized by other business units, putting enough emphasis on that team, and all that goes accordingly, watch the revenue grow. Back to Adam to hear more about this indispensable business function. So as you are elevating the contributions, the value exchange that pre-sales is providing internally Mm -hmm. to AE counterparts, but certainly in the customer-facing external value exchange. Talk to us about even the competencies that stand out to you in candidates on your team that are going to be those playmakers, that are going to be providing proportionally as much star power as generally we associate with the AE but oftentimes maybe marginalized for the SEs. What are the sort of, again, competencies that for you make you feel this is a no-brainer hire? I love finding talent in unusual places. Uh-huh. And I think I've got pretty good at spotting it, right? I'm going to give my formula away here a little bit, which is probably not going to do me any favors, right? But we've got a couple of hires that no pre-sales experience, okay. right? On paper, you're thinking, these people are going to come in and you've kind of gone, all right, we'll give them a year to get to this group. So they've got some of our best performers have come in from like, you think, wow, how have they done this? And because they've got similar traits, they are incredible active listeners, right? Active listening, super skill, like superpower for yourself and sales, by the way. If people aren't familiar with active listening, get familiar with it because it, it really, really does give you an edge. They are phenomenal storytellers. They have a level of charisma that you want to listen to them. You want to spend time with them. I'm listening to their stories. I'm not bored. I'm not like necessarily sat teetering on the edge of my seat, right? It's just a relaxing story. And they can tell the same story in a multitude of ways that they appear interested and they care and they're passionate. And they're also passionate about that customer's outcome. And what I'm interested in is someone who's done surface level analysis. Do they come into an interview or talk to me? And just do a quick Google News review, right? Hey, you guys have opened a new office. You bought this company. This is cool, right? They just drop into conversation Mm -hmm. in a very natural way. What I also love is people who can talk to all levels of an organization. So they're not arrogant enough not to talk to a functional user. They can relate to that, but they can also relate to the problems of a C-suite. And that is a really hard skill to master. Being respectful, but understanding at all levels of the org and add value in every interaction, Mm -hmm. you know, so if you looked at a person, a great listener, great storyteller, somebody who does what they say they're going to do, you know, if they say, I'm going to build you a demo and show you this, deliver on it. You know, don't let somebody down because if you let someone down in the sales cycle, what's that tell you about after sale, right? Like you've got to deliver on what you say. And just someone who's diligent, just someone who shows that bit of passion. I think if you look at those building blocks, as simple as they are, how many people do you know that don't fit one of those criteria, mm-hmm. you know, and you can coach the rest. You can teach anyone in this planet how to demo. You can teach anybody in the planet how to use software. But can you teach someone to walk in a, a mile in someone's shoes? I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can teach empathy, and that's the number one. 
when you seek out these competencies and attributes in external candidates or you cultivate these talents mm -hmm. within your existing team, unquestionably, you're assembling just the Delta Force, the Black Ops, the Special Forces of SEs. And as we've talked about, you are on this incredibly noble crusade, Adam, to add more legitimacy to pre-sales and give them the seat at that C-suite table. Talk to us about any other myths that you want to bust that right now you're having to overcome and battle against that right or wrong, they exist against pre-sales. I tell you what, I'd start with a, a rallying call, actually. You, you're hitting on a soapbox moment for me here. A lot, I speak to a lot of leaders and they're like, oh, you know, and I hear this narrative on LinkedIn and it'll be something like, you know, we don't have a seat at the table. And I'm not just saying pre-sales, but there'll be people listening to your show in various roles that mm -hmm. feel that way. I don't have a seat at the table. My voice isn't heard, all these kind of things. I'm like, okay. A, what are you doing about it? And B, if you don't have a seat at the table, do one or two things. Either bring your own chair to that table. You know, those little camping folded ones, right? Bring your own chair to that table uh -huh. or go to another table because do something about it. You know, don't just sit there and whinge, like just change it. And that's what I'm desperately hoping pre-sales leaders, sales leaders do. Because at the end of it, we've got customers out there who need to change, who need to evolve, who need to transform. And whether you're sales or pre-sales, we've got to work together to achieve that for our customers. And actually, that's what the Noble Crusade is. It's not to elevate the role of pre-sales. Mm. It's to make buying a really ple pleasurable experience for customers that we deliver on post-sale. That's the Noble Crusade. If I'm honest, you know, I thought we thought there's some ethereal bullshit on LinkedIn. I hope I can say that right on the show. And it's just empty words. It's like, you just see the table, it's like council in public, right? Like, do something about it, you know? And kind of embrace failure in that as well. I think not enough people are bold enough. They don't try anything new. If you're going to create different outcomes, you've got to do things a different way and not everything's going to work. So be prepared to fail now and again, own failure. And, you know, that's why they put rubbers on pencils, right? Or erasers on pencils, if you depend on what continent you're from, because people make mistakes. So embrace it, embrace that whole logic and push the needle, move the needle, just try something new. I reminds me of a quote that as a young boy, my dad imparted upon me is that risk takers are disproportionately rewarded. And for yeah. listeners out there to echo Adam's advice, take big swings that doors will mm -hmm. open. And then it is on you to determine, do you possess the courage, the chutzpah to want to possibly walk through and fall on your face, but nonetheless yeah. embrace that opportunity. And, you know, you talking about, hey, like, I want a seat at the table and your challenge back to people. Well, what have you done to put a chair up to the table? I think it reminds me of a really cool story from the Obama administration. There's this story about Obama has his cabinet. So there are all of his cabinet members who have a seat at that table and concentrically around that board table are all of the chiefs of staff or the advisors. And Obama very deliberately would pulse the people in that outer ring and ask them for their thoughts and their reactions. And a lot of the brilliance, the creativity, the ingenuity, the noble crusade ideas came from that outer ring. And I use that story because I think it definitely harkens back to what it is that you're saying. Whether you have a seat at the inner table is one thing. But even if you have a seat at the outer ring as that up and comer, as that high potential person looking to breach that next sort of tier or echelon in their career, mm -hmm. take advantage of that opportunity to be bold, to be daring, to speak your mind. Yeah. And then if you're a leader listening to Reveal, make sure that you are pulsing beyond that inner mm -hmm. ring of those concentric circles because there are pockets of genius and brilliance looming just outside, not even on the horizon just outside the usual suspects that you ordinarily go to. I don't know if that resonates but, with you at all, Adam. It massively so, resonates, Danny, because, you know, you think about it, what's stopping anybody in this planet getting to the highest levels of any organization, right? There are very few people brave enough to go and breathe in that rarefied air, right? Uh, that's the truth of it. And ultimately, it's most people get in their own way, right? Why do people not post on LinkedIn? I love asking this question to people who, who aren't on LinkedIn. I'll say, people talk to me on podcasts, like, why don't you post on LinkedIn very much? Like, oh. You know, Adam, like, I don't want comments on my posts. I don't like the negative comments. I don't want people. They're so scared of trolls. Yeah. And I always reframe this for people. I'm like, I definitely want people to troll me. I really want it because it feels successful because I'm like, if I've not put enough content out there that somebody doesn't disagree with me, I'm not moving the needle. I'm not pushing things along. 
I feel so sorry for that person that they can't post, but they can come on one of my posts and be negative about it. That makes me so happy. I, you know, I've won that battle. I've won that war. So I'm like, just go out there, post, be brave, have an opinion, mm -hmm. but deliver on it. But when you fail, like you said, being brave enough to risk safe failure, you know, I'm not promoting that you like throw a load of company money away. Like, let's not be like frivolous with this, but calculated risk where you back mm -hmm. yourself to deliver on something new. And like, that is a risk you should be taking 10 times out of 10. You know, strategic thinking that results in a new gain. Go chase it. Be brave enough and bold enough to back yourself because I often ask people, and I've mentored a couple of people where they said this externally, and they'll say, you know, I really want to get to that pre-sales director. I want to get to a level. I'm like, okay. A, why are you that bothered about the title? But that's a different thing. B, what would you, what are you doing differently? So you go to LinkedIn, you, congratulations, you've got your promotion. Brilliant. So you go to LinkedIn, you update your job title on LinkedIn and you buy it. Brilliant. What are you doing next? And they'll go, oh, I don't know, actually. Yeah. Make sure that when that moment comes, the answer should be, I wouldn't be doing anything different to where I am now. Do the job ahead of you before someone gives you that title. It should be a formality. It should just be a, weren't they always doing that job? Yeah. Well, we just, you know, cemented it with a title. Like that's the way to create this change and to raise the profile and get a seat at the table. You've got to do the job ahead of you. And you know? we talk a lot with guests who are on the show, Adam, who are similar to you, wildly successful. They possess titles that most of us aspire to have, but can't ever sort of really see the path to get there. And mm. something that you just said about embracing the possibility of failure, assuming the courage it takes to take, you know, on those risks. Is there a time in your career that you feel is really formative, this seminal moment where that door was open and you took the leap and you ate shit? And you just totally flopped. And if there is, if you'd be so candid and vulnerable to share with us what happened and what are the lessons you took away from that? Somewhat weirdly, someone asked me on a different catch up only late last week this exact same question. Give me an example of time that failed. I said, I can give you small examples where I failed, but actually, I, this is going to sound really bad and not intentional. I haven't had any major massive failures because I take very calculated decision. Mm -hmm. That's the accountant in me, right? Yeah. I know what I'm getting into. So when it comes to, I mean, I remember my early days of public speaking. Oh man, if you listen to the early days of my podcast show, awful, right? Yeah. Like I'm not even going to beat around the bush, not what they are now. And that learning in public thing, mm -hmm. I had to believe that wasn't a failure to keep going with it. You look, I mean, your podcast host, right? Most podcast shows never make it to 20, 30 episodes ever. Yeah. Right. And so the belief that you're adding value, and even when you know oh, that wasn't a great episode, you keep going because you believe in the bigger reason. Micro failures for some people turn into major failures. Yeah. And what I feel I've been good at is separating micro failures from major failures of going, I'm not going to let these micro failures build up so they become a major failure. I know when to put something down and move on, fail fast, you know, rather than failing hard. And I think that's a real skill. I encourage everyone that I mentor to do that. You know, know when you're failing, know the signs of failure and go, do I keep going? Cause I think it's going to turn or do I get out of there? Right. Because we all know people who've committed so hard to something that they just have to see it through and it's just failing in front of your eyes. Right. Like that is not a way to gain respect in any organization. So I, I put milestones in that I knew, Hey, I'm not achieving the change I want here. Right. Go back and review it. Is this still the right thing to do in the cold light of day? Because we never have hindsight, you know, so. If I look back, would I do it differently? And if I would, pivot, change, be agile, go again. And don't be so kind of arrogant or bold enough to think my way is the only way. Yeah. And that is like really sage advice here. The best things I've done have been other people's ideas often. The other thing that I've always struggled with is people don't democratize their thinking very much. You know, like I'll think out loud a lot, not with on the podcast, but I'll, I've got industry peers and I've got people at other orgs where I just network. We don't have an agenda. We just sit and chat. And out of that, I'll go, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And they'll go, yeah. And they'll coach me on that idea. So before I ever go and implement it, I've kind of got a broad spectrum of input that shapes that idea to a mm -hmm. point that it's broadly going to be successful. The question is how successful, but failure is something you learn to manage. I think I quite, I like failure. I love failure. I'm weird like that. I like the feeling of knowing there's the limit. That's yeah. the edge. All right. Well, I'll go and push that next time, but I want to fail because I want to know why. Yeah. You know, well, I appreciate that when societally we stigmatize failure as this setback, yeah. 
And you have stood that on its head and said, no, let's lean into failure, either at the micro level or if it's a colossal failure. I think for our listeners, the point rings true to we had Guy Raz on the podcast and Guy talks about, I mean, he is interviewing the titans in industry, Charles Schultz Mm. of Starbucks, Michael Dell of Dell Computers. He says, I don't want the victory lap of you ringing the bell on Wall Street. I don't want to know what it's like to be a billionaire. I want you to tell us when you were on the bathroom floor of your probably infested apartment in the fetal position, wondering if you were going to make payroll. Those are the moments that humanize the journey to success and make it seem more attainable for the rest of us mere mortals. So just appreciate the guidance you're providing our listeners out that interpret failure as a guidepost, a barometer of where you're at today and where you want to go and summon the persistence and the resilience to keep going. Because even for someone like you who's achieved so much success, you also have to, I would say, find source that, I don't know, self-reliance or persistence to keep going. And here you are now, wildly successful, but it wasn't always a yellow brick road. It wasn't always a springtime stroll. And it took the grit and endurance to get there. Danny, you can't beat someone who doesn't know when to beat. That's the problem. That's my biggest problem, right? I never, ever, you know, this sounds super competitive, but the sales people are going to talk about this. You know, winners never quit and quitters never win, right? And it's just that mentality of I'm a bulldog at times and I just, I'm belligerent. If I believe in something, I'm going to go get it. Yeah. And my, my whole phrase, my whole, my wife bought me a picture for my office and the phrase is make it happen. I've always had that belief, just make it happen. If there's not a way, make it happen, find a way. Yeah. And just that dogged determination, but we're doing this for the right reason. Then people can't go against you when you're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, you can normally find a way through. If you're doing something for personal gain or the wrong reasons, invariably you might fail at some point. So do it for a deep, do it for something bigger. But going back to the topic of pre-sales, I think that's really important right now. I think that's really important in the industry. I think, you know, it was not been seen as just, hey, you're here to do a demo, you know, and actually we're helping buyers buy because I said to you, and a good friend of mine, Garrett Hess, that owns a company and created a company called Consensus, a fantastic guy, wrote a book called Buying, uh, Selling is Hard, Buying is Harder. And there was never a true thing said. Buying software is so, so difficult. And I say there's like a bolder responsibility, right? If I was going to ask a level of empathy, it would be this. When you sell, your quote is a boulder on your back, right? And you're chipping away at every single deal you do until that boulder becomes manageable and you can stand up and celebrate and high five and probably put a Rolex on your wrist, right? But for the buyer, all you're doing is you're moving that boulder from your back to their back. And there's a great visual in there somewhere, I'm sure. But that buyer takes full responsibility for that purchase at the point they sign that, you know, document, that contract. I think as sellers, wherever you're in, whether you're in pre-sales, sales, sales, it's empathy that we're passing that boulder and we're going to help you deliver on this and these outcomes. That's going to really elevate, not just pre-sales, but the whole sales profession globally, I feel. Adam, I just, I'm stewing in the idea that winners never quit and quitters never win. <laughs> and I'm trying to catalog all of the sound bites that you've given us over the last you know, 40, 50 minutes of this episode. And I want to make sure I write these down because there's just too many to keep straight in my head. And again, I think we can unquestionably debunk that you are not a good interviewer. So fortunately for Access Group, you aren't looking elsewhere because anyone with even half a brain would snatch you up in a heartbeat. But as we're coming to a close on this episode, I do want to round out this episode with the same question that we ask all of our guests. So if you're a listener, you know what's coming. Hopefully this doesn't come as an ambush to you. But Adam, if you could describe sales or in your case, pick or choose sales or pre-sales, if you could describe either of those in one word, what would it be? Not allowed one phrase. So I'd go with pre-sales. If I was going with pre-sales and I had a phrase, I'd say the place to be right now. Uh, He's hiring. No, just kidding. But that, yeah, I'm always hiring, right? It tell me a leader is not always hiring. If I had to choose one word, exciting. I think it's an exciting part of tech to be right now, pre-sales. I genuinely believe it's the future of sales. I think we'll see more salespeople become half pre-sales people in the fullness of time, if I'm honest. I think that pre-sales is a very, very exciting place to be right now. Fabulous answer. And you have put more than enough rock star swagger, sex appeal, star power into our newfound understanding of this indispensable role across go-to-market teams. Mr. Freeman, well, I hope that you enjoy the game. As a Wrexham supporter tonight, I do believe that, you know, we are sworn enemies, at least at the match this evening. 
but we can't on behalf of everyone in the reveal studios we can't thank you enough for just being candid and honest and at times yes brash bold and daring and we hope that more leaders like you whether it's in a pre-sales function or beyond take that attitude that make it happen attitude to either get themselves or get their people a seat at the table just again the evangelism that you're doing unquestionably you're leaving that legacy that you aspire to lead so adam this has been a real treat Danny, thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Adam Freeman, the Buyer Enablement Director at Axis Group. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performance sales teams, well, head on over to gong.io. And if you like what you heard, come on, give us that five-star review. Hit us up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you may listen.